Hello, and welcome to another edition of Canada Files. I'm Jim Deeks. Our guest on this episode is Michael Ignatieff, who will be a familiar face to our Canadian viewers and probably a familiar name to Americans who read and follow discussions of political philosophy, human rights, and world affairs. But I suspect to all viewers, he's someone that they don't know much about. Michael currently lives in Vienna, Austria, where he teaches history at the Central European University there, having recently stepped down as its president. Michael's body of writing, teaching, and broadcasting, not to mention his brief foray into Canadian politics a decade ago, has made him one of Canada's most respected academics and intellectuals of the past 40 years. Michael Ignatieff, it's uh, very good to see you, and thank you for joining us on Canada Files. Pleasure, Jim. Nice to be here. I'd like to get started by asking you a little bit about your family background, which I know you would agree is unique and impressive, and I'm sure it's had a major influence on who you are today. Take us back, if you would, about 100 years or so, and briefly describe the background that you come from? Well, Jim, I, I come from a story on the Russian side, on my dad's side, of aristocrats who were big shots in the Russian ancien regime before the revolution, lost everything in the revolution, went into exile and came to Canada in 1928 and had to start over. And so I'm a story of a immigrant boy made good. That's what happened to my father. So that's my father's side. On my mother's side, uh, I am a descendant of the Grants and the Parkins. And the Grants were school teachers and Presbyterian ministers and at one point explorers of Canada in the 19th century. Um, so I have this kind of Canadian story and a Russian story and they come together and here I am. My dad did all the things that dad has to do, which is that he, he, he radiated affection and love. And so I aspired to, you know, do as well as he could, but I didn't feel pressure. I felt, I felt attraction to his career. He was a Canadian diplomat, worked for Mr. Pearson for many years. And so I grew up in a kind of Canadian public service family. And that certainly had a big effect on who I became. I knew I loved to write. Uh, I knew I had a kind of journalism journalist in me. I thought I might have a politician in me. Um, I knew I might have an academic in me, but I was pulled in three different directions and getting through my 20s in one piece was a bit of a miracle. Well, you ultimately became, as you mentioned, you became a writer a journalist, a columnist, a lecturer, a teacher, a broadcaster, a novelist, and we'll get to the politics in a moment. But primarily you were based in London, England uh, through the 1980s and 90s. In 2000, you were appointed the chair of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard, among many other appointments and uh, and honors along the way through. What, in your view, were perhaps the highest achievements that you uh, acquired along the way up to, say, 2005? Well, I, I think, I don't know about achievements, but I do know what gave me the most pleasure, and that was writing. I, I wrote some books that, uh, in the 1980s, I, I can still return to without embarrassment. I open them and think, some of this is pretty good, you know. So in terms of, it, of, of doing things, I think it was writing books I was proud of. I was very proud of The Needs of Strangers. I was very proud of Blood and Belonging. Well, I mentioned 2005 specifically because at that point you made a major career change. And uh, you had spent over 30 years writing, observing, critiquing world affairs, political philosophy, what made you in 2005 decide to enter the game of politics and 
back in Canada of all places, which you hadn't lived in really for nearly three decades. And they never allowed me to forget that uh, either, they Jim. Never so did. That, that turned out that turned out to be a big, big problem. Why did I do it? I, I, I think I did it because I'm my father's son, because he had a public service career, and I always felt that I should do it because I'd been observing politics as a journalist, and I suddenly thought I should get off the, the stands and into the arena um, because I was seriously self-deceived as well. I mean, politics is much, much tougher than you can imagine. Uh, the transition from being a journalist where you're only responsible for your own words and suddenly you're responsible for a whole party and a whole political movement, the change is, is brutal. The public scrutiny was very tough. It was a real baptism of fire, but I, you know, hell, I'm glad I did it. Did you have a genuine interest in serving constituents? Because that is a major part of the role of a politician or a member of parliament, as we have in Canada. Or was your entry into politics more from a sense of personal manifest destiny in that you really had your eye on becoming Prime Minister of Canada? Oh, look, to be honest, I certainly went in because I thought I had a shot at the top job. No question, personal ambition was the driver. I think the surprise when I got into elected politics, representative politics, I was a MP for a Toronto riding I got very fond of. Um, if you're in opposition, you're a member of parliament in opposition, about the only useful thing you can do is help constituents. I had a wonderful constituency office and I got, you know, I got such satisfaction as I got from politics, I got from helping people, you know, getting them visas, getting them this, getting them that, trying to help them through the maze of the Canadian bureaucracy. And it gave me a very um, uh, realistic view of the expectations that citizens have of their MP and frankly, how little MPs can actually do for their people. That, I, I, saw the, I saw the emptiness at the heart of our representative democracy. It was a little concerning to me, I have to say. Well, it's a long and complicated story, your political career, but let's condense it by saying you did become the national leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. Uh, the Conservatives were running the government at that time, but you had every chance, I suppose, of deposing the Conservatives and forming the next government. But unfortunately, it all came crashing down in May 2011 in the federal election of that year and you lost your own seat. Not only did the Liberals not win the election, but you lost your own seat in Parliament. You later wrote a book about that whole experience called Fire and Ashes, Success and Failure in Politics. Looking back now, a little over a decade later, is it a painful experience or a wistful one as you look back? It's painful and wistful. <laughs> I mean, if those are my choices, uh, painful because it's hard to face up to failure and you have to face up. Uh, wistful because there were such a lot of things we could have done had we had a chance at the top job. We had, there, we had an incredible team of great young Canadians, many of them now working for the current uh, liberal government in, in power. So I feel I trained up a whole generation of kids who now have extremely important jobs. Um, but it's wistful in the sense that I think I was, I would have been okay in government had I got there. I just wasn't very good at opposition. So you have to confront yourself. You have to confront your limitations, your weaknesses. You have to look yourself straight in the mirror and not fool around. And that can be painful, but it, you know, hey, I'm, I'm here 11 years later, had a good life, feel very committed to tell other young Canadians as crazy as I was to go in there, put your name on a ballot. Do you regret the experience at all? I regret being as naive as I was. I regret being as trusting as I was. 
Um, I regret being as overconfident as I was. You, you know, I have regrets, but I don't have regrets for having done it. I don't have regrets for having taken the risk. I don't have any regrets for putting my whole reputation and career on the line. And I'll live with it for the rest of my life, but I don't, I think I would have regretted my life had I not done it. Let's put it that way. Okay, let's move on and let's talk about your latest book on consolation, which is neither a memoir nor a book on political philosophy or geopolitics. Tell us what this book is and why you wrote it. Well, Jim, I, I, it, it started as a kind of accident. Um, I was asked to give a lecture uh, about justice in the book of Psalms. I thought, I don't know anything about the Psalms, but I'm going to try and learn. I went, gave this lecture, and then it was part of a, a weekend uh, uh, concert where all the Psalms were performed in beautiful settings, Bach, Handel, all these settings. And I found myself deeply moved by the Psalms. Uh, and I began to ask myself why I was comforted by the Psalms. I'm not a believer, Jim, although I respect religious belief, and my dad was a believer, and my brother is a believer, but I'm not. So the the search for consolation began with trying to understand why religious language continues to move and comfort someone like me who's not a believer. And then from there, I, you know, I spread out to the Romans, to the medieval folks. I read Dante, Montaigne, and the result is a book of 18 essays that tries to understand why a great work of consolation came out of a life in torment or turmoil. I try, in other words, to connect a great work of consolation to the conditions, to the life situation that made someone want to write it. And so I hope people enjoy the sense of recovering the lives that made consolation possible. Tell us what you mean, though, by consolation. I assume you're not just talking about the art of patting somebody on the back and saying everything will be fine. Yeah. Um, I think it's useful to make a distinction between comfort and consolation. If I was to comfort you, Jim, I wouldn't have to say a word. We'd just sit together. I'd bring you a beer. We'd, I'd put my arm around you. I'd give you a hug. I'd just listen to you. I wouldn't say a word. I wouldn't try to make you feel better. I'd just be there. If I was trying to console you, I would try to give some meaning to your experience. I would say, if it was you'd failed at something, I'd say, Jim, you gave your best. You couldn't have done any more. You left nothing on the table. I'd try to give some meaning that would make you feel better about your experience. The key to consolation is to provide meaning that gives you hope so you can go on. But it's propositional. It requires meaning. Comfort is just physical. Uh, consolation is much more propositional. And, and the problem with consolation, which we all know when we've had to try to console someone who's lost a loved one, is words fail us. You know, it, it, it's a moment where we come up to the very edge of what words can do. And, and that's why I found it such a fascinating and difficult subject, because it's at the limit of language. And all of the people I'm writing about are working at the limit of what language can do to console us. Was writing and thinking about consolation a cathartic or psychological exercise for you at the time you were doing, putting the book together? Perhaps um, in the aftermath of what was perhaps the biggest setback of your life, that is the political one. Oh, I, I, I think there's no point denying that you don't write a book about consolation unless you've been kicked in the teeth a couple of times, and politics is pretty good kicking the teeth. But I think there was much more to it than that. You know, I, I don't even think my political defeat was the most serious issue in my life. I think, in fact, the death of my parents was much more of a blow to me. Um, so there have been a number of things that I've sought consolation for in my life, not just politics. I think it was cathartic to write it, Jim, and I hope it'll be cathartic for readers to read it, 
Um, because I think one of the points I'm trying to make is that um, with the waning of religion, um, we often have to seek for consolation alone. Uh, and I wanted to restore these great books so that people <laughs> knew that they're voices from the past that can be deeply consoling when you're in a tough situation. And so I hope the book will be consoling to read because it certainly was consoling to write. You know, we're at a time in our history when it would seem that our problems seem to be even greater and more insurmountable than ever before. I mean, climate change, geopolitical confrontation, the pandemic. Do you think that collectively we need consolation more than ever before? I think there's no doubt through COVID, I saw a massive global search for consolation. You couldn't go onto the internet without seeing some poet reading consoling poetry or an artist performing or a musician playing. And they were all trying to reach out to an audience that was clearly in need of comfort. I mean, the number of people who've died in Canada, the number of people who've died in the United States is, is still an incredible shock. People listening to this program may have lost loved ones in the most literal, visceral way. People are in need of consolation. Um, and then there's this bigger issue, which you're putting your finger on, Jim, which is we're, we're not sure what kind of future we've got at all. We're not sure whether climate change will end our future. We're not, we're not sure whether these pandemics are a sign that we're going to be faced with a succession of increasingly devastating global health challenges. Um, somebody said recently that being in the middle of COVID is like driving in the fog. When you turn on your high beams, it just gets worse. I mean, I think we feel in the fog. And um, part of what I'm trying to say here is that uh, we need to show solidarity for each other in the here and now but we also need to show solidarity in time. We need to reach back to the ancients, reach back to these wise people behind us, because we really need them now, and they are there. They're as close as our library shelves. They're part of our tradition. And, and so, because the key thing about consolation is you feel alone, you feel bereft, you feel no one's gone through what we've, you've gone through. And these books help to remind you you're not alone, and you never have been alone. On Consolation is, uh, I believe, your 20th book. Uh, congratulations on the publication. I would think that you are of an age and at a stage in your life when uh, people wouldn't be surprised if you and your wife, Susanna, decided to call it a day, maybe buy yourself a nice villa in the south of France and sip wine looking at the sunset until you both breathe your lasts. Is that a dream of yours, or do you see yourself studying and writing until your head literally f slumps down on the keyboard? <laughs> I like the latter story. I mean, I, I, I'm certainly pretty big on a glass of wine on a terrace looking at a beautiful view, especially if my wife's close by. Um, but look, I love writing. I've always loved writing. I, I didn't write 20 books in a kind of, that wasn't a mistake. That's what I wanted to do with my life and I've done it. Um, every time I write a book, I come out with a sense of, I've understood something and I've possibly helped someone else to understand something. I've been a teacher all my life, Jim, and that, that gives me an enormous sense of satisfaction. It's the role of all the roles I've played, being a teacher, that I think um, I don't want to leave, I don't want to lose, and so I'm not ready to retire yet. Do you ever look back at some of your past books or columns and say, yeah, I was right on this particular subject, or conversely, boy, was I ever wrong? Um, I don't look back too much. Um, I have made a number the, the things that bother me, obviously, are the mistakes. I mean, sometimes I look back in an old book and I think, boy, that, that runs pretty well. I like, the, I like the flow here. You know, I like the prose. It's, go, it's going good.
No, the things that keep you awake at night are the mistakes you've made, and I've made, I've made plenty of mistakes. That is, mistaken political judgments, which ended up in a column or ended up in something. And, and yeah, sure. I, I, I think an, you know, any examined life gives you a kind of guilty conscience at times. No question about it. Michael, for most of the last over 100 years, uh, the world has looked to the United States for its democratic principles, its wealth and innovation, and its power to maintain the world order. But with the presidency of Donald Trump, if not before, uh, that power and influence has eroded. What's your feeling about the future? Can the world survive the decline of America? Jim, uh, I think the world can survive the decline of America, but we will be in a multipolar world. We'll be in a world where China is the ascendant power. I, I think the problems in the United States began actually in the early 60s. I, I, I often date the decline of America oddly from the assassination of Jack Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy in the 60s, which were traumatic events and began, I felt, a kind of unwinding that's just accelerated. And there's been a great deal of institutional decline and decay in American democracy. Uh, so in some ways, the entire story of my adult life from age 21 onwards has been the story of the gradual decline of American power. And uh, I think we just have to get used to that. Empires rise and fall, and this empire is clearly, I think, declining. And it doesn't mean that um, American innovation will cease. America still has a huge advance in certain key technologies that define the modern world. American science is fantastic. I taught for 15 years in American universities. They remain the best in the world. So it's not a universal story of decline and fall, but I think inexorably uh, we're moving into a world that will be possibly less stable because there is no single hegemon. There's no single boss on the block. Um, but I, I don't think uh, a world in which America is in relative and even absolute decline is a world that is impossible to manage. It just means we're all going to have to step up. Canada has spent the whole of my lifetime kind of as the sidekick to this power. We rose with them and now we have to, it's a lonelier world. It's a much more frightening world and, and that poses big questions for Canadians. We've got to stand up and shoulder more weight. Can Canada do it? Can we survive with a declining America? I don't think there's any question we can both survive and prosper. Let's remember we have, you know, the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Arctic. We've got more natural resource wealth than almost any other country I can think of. Huge country. We've made a fantastic success of multicultural immigration from, you know, guys like my dad coming in 1928 to the folks from the Caribbean and China and, you know, Africa. I mean, We've made such a success of so much. I, I, I don't have any doubt that Canada has a bright future, but we can't count on the protection of the United States. We can't count on cross-border trade being uninterrupted in perpetuity. We can't count on Big Brother coming to our help. We're going to have to play some pickup games with some new friends. We've got to strengthen our relations with the, with the Europeans. We've got to strengthen our friendships with the uh, Pacific countries, with Latin America. We've, we've got to make some new friends here pretty quick because we can't do it alone. Michael, last question, but it's one I ask all our guests on Canada Files. But from your perspective, very multinational, uh, you've observed world politics, world leaders, but you're still Canadian. What does being Canadian mean to you? It means an incurable optimism because God has been good to our country. 
It means being open to the stranger because we're constantly welcoming people from outside. It means understanding how problematic our history is. It's always a work in progress and right now we're struggling to adjust and accept the fact that our Aboriginal brothers and sisters don't see themselves in the history we tell. It's a kind of decency, modesty. Um, it's also an openness to the world, a curiosity about the world. Um, I see Canadians all over the world doing incredible things. Um, and it's also uh, cold winter mornings, that shared experience of going to school when you're a kid and it, you know, and, and hearing the sound of snow under your boots, that's Canada. Michael Ignatia, thank you so much for this. Uh, really appreciate your thoughts and good to see you again. Nice to see you, Jim. And thank you for watching. We hope you'll join us again on another edition of Canada Files. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of Wendy Deeks, as well as the following donors Akito Investments Inc., The Browning Watt Foundation, Mary Davy, John and Margaret Deeks, Michael and Mary Ellen Hogan, Ted and Alice Kernahan, David and Cheryl Carr, Philip B. Lind, The Bruce H. Mitchell Foundation, the North Pine Foundation, Francis and Eleanor Shen, the 63 Foundation, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.